you would, open your Bibles to John chapter 6, and we'll begin with a word of prayer. Father, we come humbly before you as sinners in need of a Savior, as those who need to be enlightened, as those who seek to do your will. Father, we ask that this would be a time of conviction and encouragement and instruction that you would open our eyes to behold wonderful things in your law. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, we've just entered the holiday season celebrating Thanksgiving this past Thursday. Now, it's amazing how much food gets prepared and consumed on Thanksgiving. And of course, again, how much food then turns into leftovers afterward. I don't know if this applies to you or not, but I've got a refrigerator full of leftovers right now. It's so full that I don't even know if it's even all going to be eaten. That's the thing about leftovers. If, if it sits long enough, it starts to go bad. And when it goes bad, it goes to waste. You have to, you have to throw it out. The purpose for which it was intended falls apart. What was once enough, what was once more than enough, now dwindles away. And one day you're thinking, I'm so full, I, I, I can never eat again. And then tomorrow comes, and the hunger returns. Now, it's normal for us to associate giving thanks with the richness of our resources. We, we give thanks for the feast we were able to provide. We give thanks for that new job. We give thanks that she said yes. We give thanks for the adoption that went through. We give thanks for the healing. We give thanks for the abundance of the amount. But I wonder if if anybody in here gives thanks in the season of shortage. What about those those times when there's not enough? We live in an age when when there's not enough. There's, There's not enough time. There's not enough energy. Not enough money. Not enough resources, not enough opportunity, not enough protection, not enough strength, not enough talent, not enough information, not enough freedom. What is our view of not enough? If you're like me, most of us see not enough as a bad thing, something to be fixed, something for God to remove, an obstacle to the path of progress. But you know what I found out? Sometimes the very thing that you want God to take away is the very thing God wants to use to grow your faith. Sometimes the very thing that you push away is the very thing God put into position to sow spiritual maturity. You ask for more patience, but when God gives you that coworker, you wanted a different job. You ask for a more forgiving heart, but when God brings that person back who lied about you, you pray God's judgment on them. You ask for someone to love, but when the in-laws showed up, you wish you lived further away. You ask for more time, but when the layoff came, you prayed for the work to return. You ask for more faith, but then the cancer came back. We ask for more because we see what we have as not enough. We, we push away the not enough because it runs counter to the purposes that we set for ourselves. But God doesn't work according to our plans. The God of the mountain is also the God of the valley. And what we're going to see today is that our not enough is a setup to see the sufficiency of of Christ. It's a setup. Our not enough is a setup to look from the supply to the source. Our not enough is a setup to look past the provision to the provider. Our not enough is a setup for sanctification. So let's look together at John chapter 6. This is one of my favorite Bible stories. You probably learned this story when you were in the toddler class. It's one of those stories that's very familiar to us and 
for good reason. It's the only miracle of Jesus, other than the resurrection, that's recorded in all four Gospels. Most miracles are given to us by two or three, but only here do we have one given by Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So there must be something centrally important about this story that would cause all the gospel writers to give an account of what happened. But my fear is a lot of times when we get to a story like this that's so familiar, we think, oh yeah, I've I've heard this before. You know, Jesus multiplies some bread and some fish, feeds a multitude. Clearly this shows that Jesus is God. Yep, got it. Next Bible story, please. But as I studied this text, God began to show me some things. I found out that there was a lot more to the story than what I got in children's church so long ago. So let's read it, starting in verse 1. After this, what's the this? Well, one of the important features of John's gospel is that he's really the most theologically concerned of all the gospel writers. He, he's concerned not just with historical fact, but he's also intensely concerned with the theological reasons behind why those facts happen. And so for John, often it's not a much about the what as it is the why. So he provides us with a lot of details that are missing from the other Gospels in order to clue us in on why these things took place. There are two aspects to the after this. On the one hand, we learn what the disciples were doing. On the other hand, we learn what Jesus had been up to. John provides us with what Jesus had been doing. In John chapter 5, Jesus had had healed a man on the Sabbath. And of this, of course, broke the, the Jewish law, Jewish custom. He was charged with breaking the Sabbath, which, which, again, this is breaking the law in the eyes of the Jews. And Jesus had called God his father. He made himself equal with God. He declared that his authority was over the Sabbath. He he said that he was greater than John the Baptist, that he was greater than Moses, and that they both bore witness about him. Now, the other Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, inform us about what the disciples had been doing. Jesus sent them out to perform miracles and heal and proclaim the kingdom of God. And at the end of their journey, a significant event happens, and that was that John the Baptist gets beheaded. The burial of John concludes their mission, and they return to Jesus to tell him all the news. And after having just learned about John's head being lopped off, after having buried his body, how do you think the disciples felt? One of the major spiritual leaders of the day had had just been killed. This was a major setback. It would have cast a long shadow over the disciples' faith. Not only were they tired from traveling, weary from working, tired from the crowds, tired from, from being bombarded with the needs, but they would no doubt have also been emotionally exhausted by John's death tired and hungry, bearers of bad news. That's the after this. And so after this, we read, Jesus went away. Now, why does the text say Jesus went away? Why not just say that he went to? You don't use the word away unless you're trying to draw attention to the thing which you went away from. For example, if I said, I went to the grocery store, you would know the place to which I went. However, if I said, I went away from my house to the grocery store, not only would you know the place where I went, you would also ask, what is it about your house that made you want to go away from it? Well, that's what's going on here. But we find out what it was in the next verse. Let's keep reading. Into verse 1, he went away to the other side of the Sea of Galilee which is the Sea of Tiberias. Verse 2, and a large crowd was following him. This large crowd was the thing that Jesus and the disciples were seeking a respite from, at least it seems that way. 
You know, it's difficult to get a break and rest when you're surrounded by so many people all the time. There's a lot of needs, concerns, conversations, healing, and work that needs to be done. There comes a time when, when you just you need a break. And John the Baptist's death amplified the desire to get away from it all. And that's the reason why Jesus and the disciples here went away. Mark records for us that Jesus told the disciples to come away and rest. But why was this crowd following Jesus in the first place? Only John gives us the reason why. The other Gospels record the fact that the large crowd followed Jesus. But again, here John, providing some additional detail, gives us the insight that the reason why the crowds followed so closely and persistently was, verse 2, because they saw the signs that he was doing on the sick. You see, they were interested in what he could give them a spectacular display of divine power, healing for the sick. They were interested in the supply and the spectacle, but not so much the source. I've seen this countless times. Those whose habit it is to only come to Jesus when they need something from him. You ever notice how the most godless person you've ever met, when they get in trouble big enough, they call out to God to save them? how you know you can't get away from being created in the image of God. You know that you have a creator. When you're desperate enough, you'll call out to him. But even as believers, because of sin, we're oftentimes drawn to more of what he can give than who he is. Consider our prayers. For a lot of us, what we mostly pray for consists of asking for the things we want. Oh, Lord, I I need healing for this sickness. Lord, I need this new job. Lord, please grant me the promotion. Lord, fix my crazy kids. Lord, don't let him find out about that. Lord, let her say yes. Lord, let that check clear. Lord, let the test results come back negative. We're needy people. There's no doubt about that. And Jesus is the great need meter. And there's nothing wrong with making our requests known to God. In fact, we're commanded to do that. But the temptation is when we focus on the need to the neglect of the provider. That's also a cultural thing. You see it in the news. Just this past week, there was a front page news story of a particular group who had cast their support for a particular candidate, only then to demand their free handouts. While there's nothing wrong with asking God for the things you need or even desire, the problem is the failure to honor the giver behind the gift. Jesus isn't looking for a bunch of supporters who can use him for their own selfish gain. I'll I'll pay the tithe because then I'll have some spiritual clout when I come to ask for the things that I want. I'll make sure that I have the perfect attendance record so my opinion carries more weight in the discussion. I'll serve some extra hours this week because then Jesus might grant my request. Jesus is looking for those who come to him for who he is. Jesus can give healing, but he is life. Jesus can give possessions, but he is our treasure. Jesus can give success, but he is our victory. Jesus can give the prospect, but he is our hope. Jesus can give the guidance, but he is the way. Jesus can give protection, but he is the good shepherd. And I don't know about you, but I'd rather have the source, then the supply. The the supply is perishable, but the source is imperishable. The supply comes and goes, but the source stands forever. The supply can be taken away, but I know that he is with me, and he will not leave me or forsake me. Verse 3, Jesus went up on the mountain, and there he sat down with his disciples. Jesus sat down because he had reached the place where he wanted to be. It's interesting that the place he goes just happens to be a place where a large crowd could gather. That is, he didn't retreat into a private home. This was not an upper room occasion. And this mountain was not what you would think of as a a jagged, rocky cliff. 
it was more what you would think of a, a, a rolling hill that overlooked the city. It was away from the hustle and bustle. It, it, was, it was a quiet place. It was a place where Jesus could easily be heard. It was a place where anyone around him would be able to see him because he was in an elevated position. Verse 4, now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. Now begins the setup. It's interesting that only John writes that the Passover was at hand. He's cluing us in on, on what is about to p- take place is, is somehow connected to the Passover. He, what he's about to reveal should draw our attention to the features of the Passover. The Passover was at hand. And Jesus chose this particular occasion to feed the crowd. They didn't have to go out and find a Passover lamb. Instead, they were standing in front of the Passover lamb, but they didn't know it yet. Verse 5, lifting up his eyes then and seeing that a large crowd was coming toward him, Jesus said to Philip, Where are we to buy bread so that these people may eat? He said this to test him, for he himself knew what he would do. Did you catch that? Jesus knew what he was going to do. He knew about the lack of food. He knew they had no food to feed the people. He also knew that they didn't have the money to go and buy food for all the people. It's a setup. Jesus knew you would lose the position. He knew you would be abandoned. He knew what happened to you. He knew the virus was coming, and he knew what he was going to do. It's a setup. Now, Matthew provides a couple of additional details in chapter 14, verse 15. The disciples said to Jesus, This is a desolate place, and the day is now over. Send the crowds away to go into the villages and buy food for themselves. But Jesus said, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. Mark tells us that the disciples had been so busy that they didn't even have, what he says, the leisure to eat. And Jesus asked them to come with him to rest for a while. But instead of getting rest, they got more work to do. Have you ever been in a situation where there was light at the end of the tunnel, where where the end was in sight, where you could see the top of the mountain, and just when you finally get there, it's a false peak. The mountain, it keeps going up. And you thought you were done, but the work just, just kept coming. You finished a hard day at work, and you get home, and you expect an evening of relaxation. You walk in the door, but the kids are all running around yelling and screaming, The dog needs to be walked. The faucet's leaking. And what you had expected to be an evening of rest turns out to be another round of labor. Now, we can understand why the disciples asked Jesus to send the crowds away. They say that it's so the crowd can get something to eat. They state it in such a way that it appears that their concern is for the crowd. But I suspect the real reason that they asked for the dismissal of the crowd is so that they themselves could rest and eat. That's what they're anticipating. You know how it is. You've got something that you want, but you don't want to make it seem like it's you that's really needing it, so you, you, you ask for someone else, you know. You look cold, dear. We better, we better turn the heat up. You look like you had a hard day at work. We better go out for dinner tonight. You know, the expression of... of, of Interest in another's welfare is just more of a a veiled attempt at self-interest. But see, the disciples weren't so much different from us. But Jesus knows what they're thinking. And it's time for the setup to be revealed. In two cases, Jesus draws the disciples' attention to their lack of supply. In the case of Philip, Jesus asks where they might go to buy bread, knowing that they didn't have the money to buy the bread. In the case of the other disciples, Jesus commands them saying, you give them something to eat, knowing that they didn't have enough food. So not only do the disciples not have enough food to give, they lack the means of procuring the food that they need. 
They don't have any food, and they can't go and buy more food either. That the people have no food is, is like our spiritual condition. We have no spiritual life in us. That the disciples could not provide food is like all our attempts at self-help. You know, the bookstore is filled with books that promise a better you, that promise the grand secret to a happy life, that promise how to be more fulfilled, how to be successful, but they all end up falling short. That there's no money to buy food is like all our attempts at satisfaction outside of Christ. We're bankrupt. We cannot purchase spiritual life. We cannot buy ultimate joy. And so Jesus purposefully draws their attention to their lack of food and money. But in order to do what? What does the text say? To test them, to see if they would look to him rather than their resources. He was setting them up to look to him. He was setting them up to know him. And the disciples were set up in a situation where their supply was no match for the demand. You ever been in a, in a situation where you just you couldn't keep up with the demand? I remember when my kids were young, uh, there, was a, there was a time when I, I remember how big of a mess they could make. And it wasn't so much the size of the mess, it was more how fast the mess could accrue. I, I remember... One time, uh, Julia had gone to the grocery store, and, and I was there with the three kids, and so I thought, you know, we'd gather around together and, and play a nice game together, and we get going, and I look up, and there's only two kids, and I'm missing one. Where's the missing one? And I walk into the next room, and, and the floor is, is, is covered with crayons and paper and stickers, a huge mess, and so I began to, to pick up and clean up the room. I make it back, and then I look over, and well, now there's only one kid, so now I'm missing two, and now one down the hall, I hear munching and crunching, and there has been crumbs and open bags of chips all over the floor, and then down the other hall, I hear a big crash, and that sounds like a thousand pieces that just broke all over the place. I just couldn't keep up with the mess. It was more than I could handle. I was not enough for that situation. And when Julia got back and walked in the door, I was just like, help. But here in the text, Jesus draws their attention to their insufficiency, and he does it in order to grow their faith. Let's see. Let's see how. Verse 7, Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread would not be enough for each of them to get even a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish, but what are they for so many? Do you see the setup focusing on the insufficiency? What what I have is small, so it must not be enough. I only make $7 an hour. My contributions won't make a difference. I only get one vote, so it won't make a difference. I don't have a lot of patience, so surely I can't work in the toddler class. I don't have a nice enough house, so I can't show hospitality. I don't have a lot of time, so I can't do family devotions. I don't have a lot of strength, so I can't serve the church. The disciples' problem was that they saw the shortage as a barrier to blessing. They saw the loaves, but they didn't see the bread. They saw the morsels, but they didn't see the food. They saw the coins, but they didn't see the treasure. They saw the product, but they didn't see the provider. And the disciples failed the test. You feed the people. I can't because I don't have enough. Serve the ministry. I can't because I don't have the gift. There's, a, there's an old story. It was a preacher's story that it was a pastor who was going to be out of town one Sunday, and so he needed to fill his pulpit supply for that weekend. So he reached out to his friend who graciously agreed to come. And he, he preached a great sermon. It was, it was about evangelism and the need for the gospel to be proclaimed to the nations, all up until the end where the preacher said, but if you don't have the gift of evangelism, that's okay. You don't have to evangelize. Someone else can do that. Well, when the pastor of that church found out about it, he went up to his friend and said, you know what I'm going to do? 
I'm going to come to your church next time, and I'm going to preach on giving. And at the end, I'm going to say, but if you don't have the gift of giving, don't worry, you don't have to give. I'm sure someone else will fill your shoes. <laughs> the disciples wanted to do ministry. They wanted to follow what Jesus had called them to do, but when the opportunity came, they tried to get rid of it. Send the people away, they say. But the shortage is not a barrier to blessing. The shortage is the beginning of blessing. Jesus said, verse 10, have the people sit down. Now there was much grass in the place. It's interesting that John draws our attention to all this grass to show that the place where Jesus had positioned the disciples was really a setup to reveal his sufficiency. So the men, they they sat down, about 5,000 in number. Why mention 5,000? Why that number? Well, some have suggested that this points to John's experience with Peter before the Jerusalem Council in Acts 4.4 where we read, many of those who had heard the word believed, and the number of men came to about 5,000. Why five loaves? Why not six or 10 or 13? Well, we get from five to 5,000 by a difference of a thousand fold. A thousand fold increase is, is a pretty standard biblical depiction of God's supply for his people in his covenant mercy. Exodus 20, verse 6, he shows steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. Deuteronomy 1, may the Lord, the God of your fathers, make you a thousand times as many as you are and bless you as he promised you. Deuteronomy 7, God keeps his covenant to a thousand generations. Verse 11, Jesus then took the loaves, and when he had given thanks. What's Jesus giving thanks for here? If it was me... I'd, I'd probably complain because I would look down at the lack of provision and say, God, we, we only here have five loaves and two fish. We need some more, please. This, this is not enough. This is insufficient. We need more. But, but you know what I found out? Some, sometimes God uses our not enough because it's the purpose of God working in us. The, the disciples thought the purpose of the five loaves and the two fish was to feed the people. That's wrong. The purpose of the five loaves and the two fish was to grow their faith. That's the purpose of the loaves and the fish, that Jesus might demonstrate himself as the source of life. The setup serves to showcase the sufficiency of God, and it does so in four ways. Number one, the bread of life is never not enough. Verse 11, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also the fish as much as they wanted. And when they had eaten their fill, Matthew, Mark, and Luke all write, and they all ate and were satisfied. You see, only Jesus can bring true satisfaction to the soul. You can try to fill your life with all kinds of joys and pleasures. Maybe you look to your work for satisfaction. Maybe you look to your family. Maybe you look to money or achievement. If I could just get that new title, I would be satisfied. If I could just get that new boat, if I could just get that second degree, if I could just get that position, if I could just get that location, if I could just lose the weight, that job, that if I could just get that job, if I could that, get, just get that child, if I could just get that cure or that healing. And we set before us these objects of our desire, and and we assume that they're the things that will bring us satisfaction, and they might, they might, for a while. But the disease comes back, the car gets stolen, the the company goes out of business, the kids move away, the muscles weaken, the mind loses its acuity, and we're right back where we started. But what if there was something that could satisfy? What, What if there was food that did not perish? What if there was a way to be really, truly satisfied? Well, the interpretation of this miracle shows us just that. In fact, Jesus himself explains his actions here in the very same chapter. As he debates the crowd the next day, he says, look down in verse 27. Do not work for food that perishes, 
but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. The food that endures is not the food that perishes. This is a different kind of food. This food does not come from the world. This food comes from the Son of Man. This food is not a thing, but a person. Verse 31, our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, as it is written. He gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus then said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, it was not Moses who gave you the bread from heaven, but my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is he who comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Jesus draws a direct parallel between his feeding of the 5,000 and the manna that the Israelites received in the desert wandering. Just as the Israelites complained of not having enough food, so the disciples complain of not having enough. Just as God provided manna from heaven, Jesus provides food for the people. Just as the, the Israelites, they had plenty. We read in Exodus 16, this is what the Lord has commanded. Gather of it, each one of you, as much as he can eat. The people had their fill as much as they could and were satisfied. The people of the crowd are interested in this food that endures. And so in verse 34, they, they say to him, Sir, give us this bread always. Again, they're, they're still looking for some stuff, a free handout. They're looking to the provision and not the person. But Jesus said to them, verse 35, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me shall not hunger, and whoever believes in me shall never thirst. Now we're in the position to understand the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. It's, it's not about the number of fish. It's about the necessity of faith. It's not about stuffing the stomach. It's about satisfying the soul. Jesus is the bread. The loaves just point to him. The disciples not enough was a setup to demonstrate that the bread of life is never not enough. All were satisfied that ate the bread. It was enough to fill them all. But the story doesn't end here. Look at verse 12. He told his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments. Now, wait a minute. Why are there leftovers? Seems like an oversight on Jesus' part. It seems like a miscalculation. If it was me, I would have you know, got out my iPhone and crunched a few numbers. Let's see, we have uh, 5,000 men, we have 1,700 women, 300 children. Uh, so we need, if we carry the one, uh, 3,428 loaves and, and 2,365 fish and Everyone gets to eat their fill, and there's no mess to clean up afterward. But that's not what Jesus did. He had something further he wished to show the people, and that is this. Number two, the bread of life is never just enough. There's more than being satisfied. There's still work to be done. There's still some additional distribution that has to take place. The bread of life is not meant to sit statically. It's meant to be given, to continue to be given, to continue to spread its influence. The bread of life is never just enough. It doesn't stop with you. Why did they have leftovers? So they could continue to disseminate the gift that they had been given. You know, if, all, if all we do is, is, is come in here and, and we consume the word and we never take the word to the people, we grow fat and slow and lazy. The word of God is meant to be treasured, but not locked in a safety deposit box. Like when you receive good news, you don't keep it to yourself. You, you give it to others so that they can share in your joy. The bread of life is never just enough. It goes beyond enough. It's, it's actionable. Number three, the bread of life is never wasted. Verse 12, he told his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments, that nothing may be lost. This, this is one of the differences between the manna given for the Israelites under the old covenant and the bread of life given for the people in the new covenant. We read in, in Exodus 16, verse 19, and Moses said to them, 
let no one leave any of it, speaking of the manna, over till the morning. But they did not listen to Moses. Some left part of it till the morning, and it bred worms and stank. Moses was angry with them. Morning by morning they gathered it, each as much as he could eat. But when the sun grew hot, it melted. See, under, under the old covenant, God's provision for his people sometimes went to waste. Its, its effects were lost. The manna leftovers would see corruption. And from then on, it would, it would be ineffective to feed the people. But in the new covenant, the true bread from heaven never sees corruption. And we read in the Psalms, For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, or let your Holy One see corruption. Acts 2, David foresaw and spoke about the resurrection of Christ, that he was not abandoned to Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. Acts 13, for David, after he had served the purpose of God in his own generation, fell asleep and was laid with his fathers and saw corruption, but he whom God raised up did not see corruption. The bread of life is always effective. It never goes to waste. It is never lost. It is never corrupted. You know, the manna, the manna could help you delay death. But the true bread from heaven creates new life that endures forever. And that the leftovers were gathered up communicates the incorruptible nature of eternal life. But, but it also communicates something else. Look at verse 13. So they gathered them up and filled 12 baskets with fragments from the five barley loaves left by those who had eaten. Now, why, why 12 baskets? Why, why not 100? You know, hundreds more than 12 should be better. And if you had the ability to produce food on demand, I mean, wouldn't you ensure that no one ever went hungry again? But this is, this is not Jesus' purpose. He ensured that only 12 basketfuls remained, no more and no less. So why 12? Well, remember what Jesus had, had commanded earlier. After the disciples had suggested that Jesus send the people away and go buy food for themselves, Jesus said to them, no, you give them something to eat. Now, now there was one basket full for each of the 12 disciples. What, what once was an empty storehouse is now stocked to the brim. You know, so some of you in here, don't think that you have anything to give. I don't have the skill. I don't have the finances. I don't have the time. I don't have the right background. I didn't come from the right place. I don't have what it takes. That's just not my personality. And some of you have been told all your life that what you have is not good enough. What you have is too small. What you have is too weak. What you have is insufficient. What you have could never make a difference. But if you're a believer in Christ, what you have is the bread of life. Your basket is full. You can feed the people. You can speak a word of encouragement. You, you can perform that act of kindness. You can give thanks in the midst of suffering. You can start those family devotions. You can serve on the team. You can turn the other cheek. You can refuse to retaliate. You can stop the gossip. You can forgive what they did to you. Because Jesus is never not enough. Jesus is, is never just enough. His grace overflows. And if you're a believer, it flows through your veins. That's how you can be a blessing to the nations. It's because you're united to the source. Your supply of grace will never run dry. And his grace is never lost. Jesus didn't waste his grace when he saved you, when he called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. His purpose wasn't thwarted when you got treated that way. His Plans weren't defeated when that relationship ended. His strategy wasn't foiled when the disease came back. His intentions weren't frustrated when they abandoned you. His design was not blocked when you couldn't pass that test. His objectives were not overcome when you lost that job. My God causes all things to work for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose for them. The bread of life 
is never not enough. Never just enough. Never wasted. And number four, the bread of life is received by faith. Perhaps you've never tasted this bread. Perhaps you've never seen this bread. Perhaps you've never heard of this bread. But there's no better time than now to come and partake of the bread of life. Jesus, the Son of God, from all eternity, sent by the Father to live the perfect life we could never live, to die the death we could not have died, bearing the wrath of God for our sin, being raised from the dead on the third day, who ascended to the right hand of the Father, who lives and reigns from heaven, and who will one day come to judge the living and the dead. This, Jesus, this bread of life, I proclaim to you. The Bible says if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Neglect not this bread. Treasure the source. Feed the people. Because your shortage is a setup to showcase the sufficiency of Christ, the all-satisfying joy of our hearts. Let's pray. Thank you, Father, for for sending us bread from heaven, a bread that is always enough, a bread that is more than we need, a bread that we can offer to others, a bread that fully satisfies, a bread that meets our deepest needs. We ask that you would help us to see your hand at work, even in our insufficiencies, that our eyes would be drawn to the fullness of of your glory, the author of life, that we would faithfully steward the grace that we have received, that your purposes would be accomplished, and that we would conform more and more to the image of your Son. We ask it in the name of Jesus our Lord. Amen.